And um, with no further delay, I would like to invite Professor Maria Jean Bien to the stage to talk a little about the project. Well, so good, af good afternoon. Uh, well, we are delighted to present the project uh, Plastic Sea, uh, which is funded by the uh, Blue Fund. Uh, but before uh, trying to explain what is the project, uh, I would like to uh, talk a little bit of the background. Oops. And um, as you pr probably are all, all aware, marine litter, uh, which has eight, more than 80% of plastic, has become a global pollution problem. And uh, these uh, plastic, they have different sources uh, from um, rivers, coastline, uh, inputs from the atmosphere, and you have uh, macroplastics form uh, that became microplastics with the time. And you have a large amount of marine litter and especially plastic, they came from uh, land with uh, around 10 million particles uh, per, uh, cubic meter, and you have 1 million tons from the river. So this is huge amount in the whole. This is not in Portugal, this is a whole numbers. And you have um, one to five trillion plastic bags that are sold per year. So it is have an idea about what's going on. Okay, so marine sources are another problem. And uh, you have here some images of Portugal, so you can understand what is going on. It is in a posh area of Portugal. I'm not telling which area it's going to be, but you can see that this is a huge uh, amount of plastic, and it is estimated that six six hundred and forty million tons of uh, marine. Uh, Every uh, plastic from marine sources going to have, and especially 70% are ghost nets. And uh, of these, you have fishing nets, traps, which is a problem that you're having here, and 25, 28% offline. So the plastic problem is so big that you can see it by the uh, satellite images. That's what you're having here, where these. Uh, areas are related to the five uh, more important gyres. And these are satellite images and the, other, the others are images that have been um, measured and sites. So you can see there's still a, lack, a lot of lack of information in the whole uh, ocean. So plastic are everywhere and especially in Europe. So uh, these are data from uh, the European Union, where you have 200,000, more than 200,000 particles per square meters. And although there are other things here which are not plastic, but most of them are plastic. And uh, the Japanese, they have a very good database. And uh, with that database, it is uh, important to see they have a lot of plastic in the, um, Atlantic, a little bit more in the North Atlantic than in the South Atlantic. So you start understanding what is going on. And also this was the big issue of finding a plastic bag in the Mariana Trench, which is uh, 10, uh, 10, 100,000 meters depth. So this, this is why with all this information that plastics have become a major political issue even. Oops, and we have a new problem now, which are these uh, yes. as you can see, have a hundred billion masks which are used per month, which might the size of Switzerland, and all most of them are already in the uh, in the sea. And these are polypropylene based with nanoparticles of propylene. So this is another thing to add up uh, to the system. Oops. For those who are not uh, very familiar, you have these uh, 
the plastics have physical, chemical, and biological impacts. So they, we have the microplastics that with size, they became the microplastics, which is what we are interested in. And also the problem that these plastics can have biofouling with other contaminants or even microorganisms or even bacteria, and then they tend to sediment by physical uh, properties, but also chemical, uh, they can absorb other contaminants. And we have already a lot of data. And uh, although they absorb other contaminants, they can leak, which is a leachate, other chemical compounds, which are very toxic. And also we know already that there is a biological increase uh, around the, um, within the food web. Oops. So the uh, Plastic Sea Project is entitled The Impact of Microplastics in the Ocean, Sea Salt and Aquaculture. And they have several main tasks. Uh, the first one is monitoring the microplastics in coastal areas. The other one is assessment, the impact of microplastics in sea salt production. And then the other one is also trying to have an idea about the amount of microplastics in agriculture facilities in order to take measures to decrease that. And take into account all these data, we, uh, there's an error there, the pathway modeling and data analysis. So we are uh, trying to collect all these data and uh, increase a model facility that's already in place here at University of Algarve. And then the last one is the impact of microplastics in humans. So you're gonna have the opportunity to have data or information about each of these um, work packages. And the partners of the um, Plastic Sea Project, uh, besides CIMA, it's the IPMA, the and also Sagra Marisco, which is a, a PME, and also uh, the, uh, the Association of the Aquaculture Productions, Siena, and the uh, CCV Algar, which is Centro de Ciencia Viva, which unfortunately cannot be here. So regarding the uh, first part, which is trying to assess the amount of uh, microplastics, we have uh, you're going to have more details afterwards, but we have collected samples in all these areas in south part of Yalgar, basically uh, water, sediments, and marine organisms, and also in aquaculture facilities from Aveiro to the south of Portugal. And that's uh, basically uh, what I would like to talk about. Um, although uh, you can also use plastics to do some nice things. So thank you very much to have the opportunity to see uh, following up what I've been said about each of the work package that uh, our colleagues are going to um, tell us what they've done. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to have a round of presentations about the sampling process of this project. And I would like to welcome to the stage uh, Sonia Christina to talk a little bit about the coastal sampling. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sonia Christina. I'm a researcher in the Center for Marine and Environmental Research here in the University of Algarve. And I will talk about the sampling process and the sampling sites of the Plastic Sea Project related to the coastal area sampling. So this, um, this, um, this work was uh, under the working package one of the project that it's called Monitoring Microplastics in the Portuguese coastal area. We have made two sampling campaigns to assess the, the levels of microplastics in water, in mussels, and in sediments in the south coast of, of Portugal. The first campaign was in spring between the 12th of uh, March until the 18th of March. 
and the second campaign occurred this um, during this autumn between the 22 and 24 of September. We have sample in 11 sites um, and the sampling campaigns were made by two partners of the project by SEMA team and by Sagre Marisco team. Um, the SEMA partners made uh, the samplings in the east part of the Algarve coast and Sagre Marisco was responsible for the west part of the Algarve coast. The sampling strategy follow the microplastic sampling and storage protocol for water sediments and organisms that was adopted by the SEMA members of the project. So for the field work, we have uh, created a strategy for the water samplings. Um, we have gathered together and we have discussed the way of avoiding everything that we have from plastic during our samplings. So for the water samplings, we going to we collect 10 liters of water of the surface with aluminum uh, bucket um, and with the aluminum bucket and then it was put into two uh, glass bottles of five liters as you can see in the in the uh, photos uh, for the organism sampling uh, we catch uh, between 20 25 it will depend of the study site of the availability of these organisms in the study sites and they were collected by hand or with the help of a, a sizzle, of a, a wood sizzle, and wrap up in aluminum file, and then we, we transport them in a thermal box. The sampling of sediments, uh, we use cores. Um, in this case, we made one um, of uh, stain, stainless steel. As you can see in the picture um, above, and then we storage in the glass flasks, and we normally we we take eight samples from each of the sites. We also uh, made some additional um, measurements, or uh, we take the geographic coordinates of your uh, station uh, sites the tide condition, the current, and the wind direction, the temperature and salinity. So we have in our, the coast of Algarve, we measure in 11, uh, 11 study sites, one in the west part of the Algarvian coast and the, other, the rest in the, the, the south part. So our first site, it is Praia da Barriga, it is um, a sandy beach with exposed uh, um, rocks uh, where we have predominant uh, Northwest swell located in the, um, the West Coast, north of uh, Cape St. Vincent. In the, the pictures, we can see where it's exactly the, the location of the study site and uh, the places where the samples were taken. Then we have um, the second station that is in, in Sagres, in the, the, the part of Bolieira. Uh, and here we, we have um, taken... Sorry. Sorry, someone has their microphone <laughs> and muted. Yes. And someone, give me a second. Oh, sorry. Well. Okay. <laughs> Let's get back to presentation. É da net, professora, o aviso. Okay. Thank you. Right. So, uh, in the port, we have a pier where the boats came, um, mainly the, the, the pier where the tourist boats came to, uh, to bring the tourists from the, the boat trips. So we 
we pick the samples on this pier in in the um, as you can see in the in the pictures in the letter that it's in the floating pier uh, the water we take in the same place but the sediments they have to be collected by diving so it was more or less five meters north from the floating pier where the center that where we have uh, available sediments so the next uh, study site is Praia do Barranco. Uh, it's a sandy beach with a, lar a large boulders in the right hand side of the beach. Uh, it's located uh, east from Cape San Vincent uh, and the um, Sagres Arbor. And uh, it's also uh, offshore of this beach. We have located um, offshore aquaculture. The fourth study site is Meia Praia in Lagos. Uh, it's um, a sandy beach with an artificial uh, jetty with large boulders. And it was the place where we catch the samples. The mussels were collected from the, uh, the, from the boulder and, and um, the sedi sediments surrounding the, 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 the part of the boulder. The the fifth uh, study site is in Pachal, Putimão, uh, as you can see uh, there. And it's an intertidal, intertidal uh, muddy beach uh, located in the uh, Arad River. Near Portimão, the marina of Portimão, Doca Pesca, and it's uh, also nearer from the river mouth. We can see in the picture the, the, the places where the water samplings were taken and the mussels and the sediments. The next one, it's Vila Moura. Um, the samples are collected in the west side of the entrance of Vila Moura, Marina, um, in, the, um, in the sandy area with boulders. In Fort Novo Quarteira, um, the, the strategy is the same. We take near to the, 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 the groins um, and the, the, the muscles were more tricky because they are very, uh, they are not too many. So we have to, to sample not uh, near to the place where we take this, the sediments and the water, but we have to collect in, um, around the, the grind part. Um, Followed by Praia de Faro, uh, in the, the part of Ria, uh, we have collected the sediments uh, at the base of the bridge uh, of Praia de Faro. The, as well, the water um, was also uh, taken from there and the, the mussels were collected from the, the pillars. Olhão, uh, in the station of Olhão is uh, located in the dock of Olhão, near to the Club Naval de Olhão. Um, the mussels were taken for a, collected for a mooring cable of a boat. That is the only place it was available. We have available mussels in that particular uh, site. Uh, the water was collected at a floating pier and the sediments were um, uh, collected in a in a ramp where we have some depositation of sediments nearby. <coughs> the, our ten study site is in Quatro Aguas in Tavira, um, where the mussels uh, were taken from the cables from the boat um, and uh, the water and the sediments from the same same uh, place. This study site, it's, um, it's located more or less uh, at uh, 900 meters from the entrance of the inlet of the Vida. Our last study site is in Vila Real de Santo Antonio, um, where we have uh, taken samples um, in this uh, small beach located in the insertion of the Western grind of Guadiana River mouth. Uh, and we have taken the, the mussels 
from these uh, rocks around it. So from our 11 sampling sites, we developed these two uh, big campaigns where we're collecting in the first campaign 110 liters of wa uh, water samples, 18 sediment samples, and more than two, 234 mussels. Our sampling uh, campaign, the same amount of water was taken. Uh, we just take four samples of sediments because to, Justine is going to talk a, a little bit more about the amount of samplings that she have. So we just repeat one of the stations. Um, and we have uh, uh, taken uh, more than two, 215 muscles. Um, so thank you very much to all of you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Sonia. So we're now going to have a presentation by Laura Ribeiro from IPMA about the inshore aquaculture uh, sampling. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to be part of this project. My name is Laura Ribeiro. I am a researcher at IPMA and my, I'm more related with fish nutrition and digestive physiology. But I'm also concerned with the interactions between aquaculture production and environment and how to make it more sustainable. So my presentation, it will be a, a little bit about the, our work on the Plastic Sea project. So the first challenge that uh, was made to IPMA to collaborate on this project was to study microplastics on bivalves. Um, but uh, our concern, of course, was immediately because uh, we work with fish for consumers, towards consumers, and our concern is also that to have a quality product to the, the consumer. And, uh, we know that microplastics in food, it's a, actually a concern. But the only problem that we have was that uh, we have, uh, I forgot to change here. Uh, we are a, a fish farmer and not properly a bivalves aquaculture. So what the challenge was, if we could use the, the bivalves that we have under a EMTA system, which I will explain a little bit. The concept of uh, integrated multitrophic aquaculture uh, towards the sustainability of production is to use uh, our, or the main objective, sorry, oops, is trying to recycle the nutrients that are obtained for the excess of the feeds that the fish are not eating and through the, the excreta from fish that can be recycled by the incorporating in the macro, microalgae or macroalgae that can be used by the bivalves. So I propose that uh, uh, in the fish farm that, uh, for, that we use for research, that uh, if it was possible to use the, 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 the oyster that we are uh, growing as a component of the integrated multitrophic aquaculture. Sorry. In, in our ponds, just for you to have an idea, we have lots of plastic around, macroplastics, and these are subjected, of course, to the uh, uh, physical, chemical and, and biological uh, um, stressors. And therefore it will be easily imagined that these macroplastics are becoming microplastics. We have uh, some uh, experimental cages studying the potential of ulva to grow uh, in a multitrophic system. In these flops, sorry, <laughs> I'm stressed with these buttons. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fat finger, that's a problem. Uh, with these floaters, we have the uh, oysters underneath growing. We use this system to, to place the oysters up outside the water and try to mimic a tidal, uh, um, a uh, tidal uh, effect of the, the, the sea. Uh, we have the, the, the nets for the cormorants. Uh, we have the feeders. You have uh, the, 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 the plastic from the uh, aeration that are important to maintain the good conditions of oxygen in the rearing environment. So we have a lot of plastic around. So the question was, uh, what type of uh, uh, type pl plastic are you using in aquaculture? That was one of the, 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 the tasks that we are uh, uh, supposed to work on, um, on this uh, survey of the plastics used in aquaculture. Uh, in a small uh, trial that we did, or just trying to collect and identify the type of plastics that we're using in aquaculture, we observed that we use, this is our old fragments that plastics that are obtained and sometimes the things are destroyed. Uh, in, in our facilities, we reared uh, uh, 
besides oyster in the multi-trophic, we have uh, guilty dead sea bream, migra, sole, sea bass, but especially uh, guilty dead sea bream is a fish that bites. So it starts eating and also the getting some corrosion on the plastic that they have. Anyway, you can see that the main five groups of plastic that are observed in aquaculture are polyethylene, polyimide, polyvinyl chloride, polystyrene and fiber reinforced plastic that is identified in aquaculture um, polymers or in, in reports on the plastics on aquaculture. But at our facilities and the, the more the plastic used in the multi-trophic integrated system, we have uh, mainly observed these four um, categories here of polymers. That this is the, 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 the for, for, and, um, for you to have an, um, an, uh, an example, this is the oysters bag that are used to rear the oysters. This is a floating part of the an aerator that you saw, that we use. This is one part also of the aerator that uh, is used to rotate the, the pedals and that are going to mix the layers of water, allowing the mixing of oxygen from the surface and the release from the CO2 produced by the organisms inside the tanks. And uh, just to be brief, here you have the polystyrene uh, supports where we place the, the, the oyster bags that are used. You will see a little bit later in a small video that we have. That was one of the, 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 um, the first tax that we are involved and we were able to present a, a small poster at uh, Aquaculture, uh, Aquaculture Europe in Funchal this year. Uh, the second task that we were involved was to assess the microplastics in oysters that were produced under this integrated multitrophic system. Um, so what uh, you observe, this is uh, some aerial views of our facility in Olhão. In these tanks in this earthen pond, you can see these uh, supports. This is the support where you use the uh, the, the oysters are placed in together with the, with the fish, with the phytoplankton or microalgae or macroalgae sometimes that are used here. And we, the, the idea was to sample inside these earthen ponds with the EMTA uh, cultivation, but also to have a control to see how was the water that was inter entering in, the, in, 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 the, in our facility. This is the entrance. We are located in the, in the Rio Formosa Park. Um, this is Rio Formosa. This is uh, uh, Armona, I think. So the water enters. We have a, a, a gate here, inlet, and the water is entering uh, with the uh, with the tides. And then we also have a pumping system, more plastics that can be released. This is a reservoir that we have to have to maintain the, our facilities because these we have ten earthen ponds of uh, two point five uh, square meters, um, ten, and then we have this small uh, um, uh, ponds that uh, have, uh, in, in terms of a surface, uh, have 150 uh, square meters. Here we have the decantation tanks when all the, the water that comes out from the, 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 the facilities is uh, decantation and we have some macroalgae that are doing a kind of a bioremediation from the water that leaves the, the, the production tanks. So for, us, for you to have an idea, we did a sample here which was the control and the sample here in the in the earth ponds in the under a multitrophic aquaculture system. Um, in the control, we just collect the water and the sediments, and uh, in the MTA ponds, we collected the oysters, the water, and the sediments. Uh, Justine and Sonia went there to teach, to teach us uh, to teach us how to collect, and especially to provide us with the good and proper equipment to do it. Especially the one for the sediment, that is really a, a must. This is an example of Javi, a colleague that is taking samples of water. Here you, you see he's uh, collecting the 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 sediments. He, he was pouring with the, the, the proper device in the vial, and here we are wrapping the the the, the oysters in the aluminum foil. We did two sampling points in the seasons, in spring and in autumn, but in that autumn we didn't sample for sediments. Now I will just show you a small video that is more, let's see if it's working.
okay, after this uh, small video for you to, to know <laughs> a little bit more about the place and about the process. And um, just to finish, um, the, 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 some, or the dissection of the tissue that we're uh, uh, observing on the video is this, uh, we were sampling the, the gills from the oysters to analyze acid phosphatase activity, which is a cytosolic enzyme that uh, we expect to be higher activity if microplastics are present, and also MDA, which is a, a, a marker for lipid peroxidation, and it's a result normally increases with the oxidative stress. So if the machinery of the organism is not in, uh, uh, working properly, it's a kind of a defense. And uh, we have this data and we are aiming to, co co to compare with the data that Justine is analyzing on the oysters from our facility. And uh, this is the team at HIPMA that is working. Pedro Pozão is the responsible for our uh, aquaculture research station. Myself, Laura, Florbella, Hugo and Javi, which did the video and is a Brazilian and have the very nice music to go with. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Laura. Oh, no, okay. no, no, no. Okay. It was just the presentation. Okay. We will now have a presentation by uh, Bruno Fragoso from Sagre Marisco about the offshore aquaculture sampling. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Bruno Fragoso from Sago Marisco, and uh, within this project, we are partners and we were responsible for um, work package three, especially task two. And uh, we, we did the uh, uh, sampling at uh, aquaculture sites and facilities. And for this, it was really important to have the co uh, collaboration of APA, the aquaculture producers that provide us uh, with contacts of producers, as well as Cooperativa Formosa for Molhão, that also provides us uh, a contact for this. So moving forward. So what uh, we did, we, we, we tried to, the big approach for this project, for this task, was to have a picture, a national picture of uh, the impacts of microplastics in aquaculture sites and the species. For this, we used, um, we selected sites where uh, aquaculture is really important, such as uh, Ria Formosa, uh, Setubal, Aveiro, and Sagres, because offshore aquaculture is now uh, expanding and more and more um, sites are being uh, given for production, then we did this uh, offshore sampling that I'll show later in a video uh, about the challenges to do the sampling there. So it was important to have a national coverage of the, this study uh, and the, this, the, this uh, important species as well. So for, for this, we did, uh, as you've seen before in previous presentations, um, sediment quarters, uh, collect water sample, and uh, bivalves of commercial size and uh, around 20, 25 individuals. So we were in a, um, in a Ria da Veil, uh, where oysters are grown in an intertidal area. They are grown in trestles, um, which are in, in, uh, inside bags of plastic. Uh, the trestles itself are made of metal. Um, so uh, the, it's a protected area, but with, um, with some uh, contribution of fresh water. Uh, and they are producing mainly for local and national markets. We also been in uh, Estuário do Sado. Um, it's also an intertidal area. The, the place of production is a, a, a kind of an island, a sand bank in the estuary, in the middle of estuary. Um, the oysters are grown in trestles and also in bags, but uh, they also use other system called the flip flop uh, systems, which uh, are uh, moving with the tides and uh, with the rising water. So they um, focus uh, in, in uh, growing crassos uh, gigas and uh, they export for a uh, French market. And also they are uh, have increasing interest in the uh, in, uh, local market that uh, to supply their um, their uh, oysters. So we were at the uh, Ria Formosa as well. Um, we visit a um, uh, clam uh, Ruditaps de Cusatus um, farm just nearby the, the uh, EPPO station. 
uh, where clams are grown in the, uh, directly in the sediment. So there's not uh, plastic involved uh, in the grow, uh, but they, they use uh, human intervention to take care of the sediment. So they apply sand and uh, gravel that is extracted, extracted from uh, nearby um, areas. So the, in the market, the focus is mostly the local and national market. And then we have the offshore, um, offshore aquaculture site um, where that is a coastal area. The farm is implanted between the 18 to 32 meters. Uh, mussels are grown in uh, long lines, but they are, uh, um, they are, uh, grown, they are uh, applied into ropes that they call droppers, uh, which are made of plastic, uh, nylon and poly, polyethylene. Uh, and beside of that, they also apply a, a net on the outside to avoid fish grazing, also made from uh, plastic. Uh, the mussels can be caught uh, in the wild uh, with collectors, plastic collectors, and also bought from uh, other sources. Uh, they are focusing mostly in international markets where they, they sell the processed mussels uh, as meat mus meat, uh, muscle meat, uh, off shell or whole mussels and they are sold in packages of plastic as well. And now I have a small video uh, to show you the process of sampling in the offshore area. Let's see if I can start. So for water samples, we use the um, sampling bottle that is lowered at uh, the, the, the depth we are interested to collect. So we did surface and bottom. And then we bring the bottle up and transfer the sample into the metal bucket. We have Gilberto here struggling to pull it in. And after the, the sample is uh, in the bucket, we transfer into the glass uh, bottles. It's difficult to uh, find the funnel when the the, the boat is uh, shaking. So we have underwater samples. And then we take uh, the quarters uh, of the first five centimeters of the sediment. We cover it with uh, a cork uh, stopper. And then we transfer it into the, the glass vial. We use a the next step then is to collect the, the muscles that we did directly from the long lines. We try to select uh, commercial size muscles. As you see, they are quite big already. So we we'll get this one done and next uh, we would like to to thank um, the Fund Azul to, to sponsor to, to, to sponsor the, the, this project and also uh, the farmers in Setubal, uh, in Aveiro, Ria Formosa and Sagres and also as well Cooperativa Formosa that uh, provide this context for the clam producers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much Bruno. And finally, for this round of presentations, we will have a presentation by Paulo Pedro about the saliniculture um, sampling. Good afternoon to all of you uh, here and online. Um, I'm going to present uh, our, um, uh, our uh, um, work package based on the saline culture sampling. Uh, but uh, before that, I would like oops. 
just to give some uh, background of um, why uh, we we are in this uh, work package and uh, where why did we get to this um, uh, salt production analysis of microplastics? Um, the this subject it's not that old in uh, in salt in salt production. Uh, the first uh, uh, published paper about uh, uh, microplastics in salt uh, came out, I think, in 2015, in, uh, and it was from uh, China. And it was analysis of uh, different sea salts, commercial salts, uh, table salts in, um, um, from different parts of China. Of course, they found microplast uh, microplastics like in many other products that you can uh, buy. Um, the, we are uh, working in an environmental analysis lab and we are doing analysis of salt for a long time. And in uh, 2017, um, it was published uh, a paper that it included some analysis of uh, salt samples from Portugal and from other countries showing uh, uh, the presence of microplastics. Um, it started some panic uh, in the uh, uh, salt producers in the, at least the small salt producers in Algarve. Um, and the, one of the reasons was because it analyzed also uh, a product that it's very uh, important for the salt producers, the, uh, the, the salt flour. And that product that has a high value in the market, um, sometime after, there's a broadcast from a, a, a German television saying that it has a huge amount of uh, microplastics and it has more microplastics than the ordinary salt. So for these producers, it was a kind of a panic alert at that time. We were in 2017. So uh, we had in that year requests for starting analyzing um, the, um, the marine salt and the uh, and, uh, and, uh, salt flour. And so we had to uh, start implementing methods in the laboratory to do that. Um, there is, um, oops, sorry. Uh, there are some specific methods to do that, uh, uh, and some special equipment that uh, uh, we don't really have in our lab. So we had to use uh, alternative methods at that time. We started by the simple uh, microscopic observation. But then we move to more sophisticated things. Um, I want to uh, emphasize that in this um, in this uh, project, uh, one of the main tasks is to monitor the amount of microplastics in uh, salt, in uh, sea salt, um, uh, but also to identify the main sources and pathways for these microplastics uh, to reach the salt. Um, the other component that it's also very important is to define um, uh, the right methodology and compare the available methods to do that. Um, we also, in these two years, been observing uh, how the producers produce this salt and what can be improved in the, in the production of salt to minimize the impact of microplastics. Um, there's also um, a task to assess the impact of uh, sea salt contamination with microplastics. Um, this is a little bit more tricky to do, and uh, we are working on that, but we still need more data to see what is going to happen uh, in the future. Um, for uh, the... For this project, we had to select uh, some producers of salt that we had already some contacts before. 
and we try to distribute these uh, sampling sites, sampling producers, um, through the 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 country uh, to try to get uh, more or less the same uh, sample sites as the other uh, activities in the project. Uh, of course, we don't have, uh, uh, I don't know, a salt, a salt production close to Sachs, so that was uh, impossible to, to get salt from, from there. But uh, we, um, we had also to change the, the salt producer from Aveiro to Figueira. It was also a change. Uh, but then we also did in Estuario do Sado, in Guad uh, Guadiana, and in Rio Formosa, we did in two places, uh, close to Faro, and um, in Quatro Aguas, that also is one of the sampling sites for the other activities. So we focused on um, uh, two different products, um, marine salt and uh, salt flour. Um, you may ask uh, why these two different uh, products? Well, um, if you consider that most of the, the plastic that we collect in this uh, uh, salt production uh, uh, environments is floating, um, the salt flour, it's important because it's, it's the first product that it's collected from the, uh, from the salt pond. And that was the reason also why uh, all that alarm in the German television about the, 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 um, the salt flower made some sense because uh, they were, in reality, it's, we, are, we are collecting the, surficial, uh, the surface of the, uh, of the water and the, the, the crystals that form there uh, might have a lot of uh, microplastics if the conditions are uh, uh, good for that. To try to have some comparison, um, and also because of the, the length of the project, um, we focus on two uh, production seasons. Um, we cannot, uh, in terms of the, the project, it was not possible to try to extend for a longer period, but uh, um, it seems to be uh, adequate to estimate some of the things. And we also have some background data from some of the producers. Um, oh, this is not very good, but um, about the, the, the sampling methods. Here, we, uh, we, it's easier for us than for the other uh, uh, people in the project. Uh, because we can, and we are doing analysis also on the finished commercial product. So we use the commercial available packages of these uh, producers to analyze the, the, the microplastics. We have different kinds of uh, packages and uh, that can also have some influence, but at the end, we want to analyze what uh, it's contained in the final product. And for that, um, this approach works. <coughs> it's not enough to understand uh, the sources of contamination in the, in the, in the sea ponds and in, in the salt ponds. And so for that, we have to do extra analysis and extra sampling uh, in the in the in the salt ponds and in the in the in the salt production facility, uh, it's um, it's common to have contamination in the water that feed, that feeds these systems, um, and we also collect some samples for that. We are doing that on a, just on a pilot scale on one of the salt producers because we couldn't do that on all the the locations. Uh, but in these locations, we are analyzing um, deeper the, 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 the entrance water in the, in the salt pond, the, the water in the concentrators, and the, uh, the water in the crystallizers. So um, this also has a kind of um, monitoring of the environment to see what are the sources of plastic 
that are transported by the wind in some occasions that are uh, from the the use of materials in the in the in the collection of salt um, and also from um, uh, let's see uh, it's uh, uh, human activities but not directly from the the production of salt but even now we told the uh, salt tourism yeah. you can have a lot of contamination with plastic that it's not in reality from the activities uh, uh, this is already for the, the analysis methods because we had also this task of validation. It's not that important here, but we are using a red Nile method with, uh, with um, uh, dyeing uh, the, the, the microplastics and analyzing by uh, microscopy. Uh, we want to compare these results with the let's say the classical uh, tear microscopy method and that's the next step that it's very important to confirm the results that we already have from the first year and actually from the second year uh, i think it's yeah this is the last one thank you very much Thank you very much, Paulo. We will do a quick reschedule of the breaks. We will now have a small five minute break and we'll come back at 20 past uh, three. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. Uh, we will now have a presentation by Justine Nathan on the preliminary results of the project. Okay, I'd like to thank everybody for their presentations before for giving us um, ideas of uh, the sampling methods and going through that process. Now, I would like to introduce you to my presentation. So I am Justine and I am working at SEMA with the lab work. So all of the samples that you've seen have been collected. I am in charge of processing them all in the lab here. Okay, this thing. This one? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so as previously mentioned, it's a multidisciplinary uh, study where we look at water, we look at sediment and organisms to find the amount of plastic in them. And we're going to start with the water. And I'm going to give you a bit of an idea of the processes that we do in the lab, as well as some results that we've got so far. It's still ongoing, so they're not complete results, but uh, it just gives you a bit of an idea of what we found out. The water from each site is filtered through the equipment seen here with uh, every uh, way possible to try and prevent any contamination of plastic, covering them all the time and only using glass and metal. Um, the filters are then analyzed underneath the microscope, which is done here. And this is some examples of plastic that has already been found in the water samples. This is from, I believe all of these are from Sagresh, and you can see the examples of the blue and red fragments of plastic. In the organisms, so different organisms are taken depending on the site, because I've been working with the aquacultural uh, samples as well as the coastal samples uh, that were shown by Bruno, Laura and Sonia. And the coastal areas, or they were all sampled for mussels, and the aquaculture was, depending on which type of aquaculture it is, uh, it was either mussels, clams, or oysters. And these are then dissected in the lab. They are then digested using potassium hydroxide and placed in an oven. And uh, once the samples are digested, they are floated, uh, as you can see in the bottom picture, uh, to try and separate the muscle content from the actual plastic in a hypersaline solution. So the plastic will float to the top. This is then collected and filtered through the filtration system. Results for the mussels, these are some examples of plastic that has been found so far, which are fibers and fragments. 
Uh, these are both from um, Portimao and Sagres locations. Uh, you can see some blue and green fragments and some blue and green fibers here. The sediment process is a little bit trickier. There's a lot more um, steps that we have to go through and there's a lot of uh, samples, as you can see, that were taken. So, first of all, a lot of the samples were from areas that are rich in organic content. So the organic content has to be removed so that the plastic doesn't stick to it so that we can actually identify it. So these were then uh, treated with hydrogen peroxide to eliminate the organic content. And then the samples are all separated using granulometry into different size fractions to be able to tell the um, grain size distribution of the, each sediment at each location and relate this to the amount of plastic that we maybe will find. Here, uh, this is not under the microscope. This is, can just be seen with the plain human eye. You can see within the sediment some examples of plastic. Uh, this has already been separated into a size class. Uh, this is from Sagresh. And then we have some more examples of plastic that is found in the sediment. Uh, this is, fill, uh, there's fibers, fragments, there's film in there. This is all from one sample in uh, Sagresh. This is not all of it. This is just a very small amount of it. Uh, so from what I've seen so far, the areas with the most plastic in are Sagresh, Oliao, and Fortimao. These areas all happen to be uh, in harbors where there is low water movement and there's high organic content in the sediment. And uh, as it, there is, it allows for deposition, there's a small grain size and also it means that the um, plastic itself can accumulate. From this, we have assumed that the amount of plastic seems to be related to the grain size, uh, which is uh, good for this um, project as we're, it's the first one to really incorporate the grain size to the um, uh, amount of plastic. Ooh. So a few overall results of what I found so far. This graph shows the amount of plastic pieces found in each location for water and organisms. There's a blue dashed line uh, in the middle just before Liao, uh, which represents the the ones before this, the locations before this, are where the uh, mussels have already been looked at and the ones after they haven't been analyzed yet. So we can see very clearly that Portimao and Sagres have very high levels of plastic for both water and organisms. And Oliao has very high plastic in the water. And we will assume that we're about to see when the mussels are uh, digested, that there will probably be a large amount of plastic in the mussels as well. This graph is the same data, but it's been adapted for the uh, pieces of plastic per gram of mussel. So this allows to incorporate the uh, size of the mussel into the uh, analysis. And Sagres and Portimao still have the uh, highest ones, but there's also Bahanko, which has um, got a high amount of plastic in the mussels because these mussels are actually quite small. So per, per gram, there's quite a lot. The color of the plastic is also taken into consideration. And this is, uh, shows the amount, the colors of the plastic in the water and the organisms. And you can see that they're quite similar with high levels of blue and black. And it was also done for just fragments alone uh, with a lot of uh, blue and black found again. The fragments were the uh, most common type of plastic that were found both in water and organisms. And this is then followed by fibers and only one piece of film was found in the water in Portimao. Here, we compare the water for the coastal sites, which are the ones that were presented by Sonia, 
to the aquacultural sites that were presented by Bruno. And the results show that there's um, higher plastic in the coastal sites. Um, this, though, is um, contributed, to, contributed to largely by the three sites that I previously mentioned with high plastic, the uh, sites of Sagres, Portimao, and Olia. So they contribute to the vast majority of the plastic that was found at the coastal sites. To sum up uh, the preliminary results, the plastic in the sediment does seem to be related to the grain size. And the three locations that we have uh, uh, found to be accumulation zones in the Algarve for water mussels and sediment are Portimao, Sagres and Oliao. As this is an ongoing project, there's still a lot of work to be done. And the second sampling campaign has just been finished and these samples are now being evaluated in the lab. This will allow us to compare between the spring and the autumn seasons to see if there's any difference. And the plastic that is collected, uh, it will be um, identified to the polymer type using FTIR analysis. And this will help us identify uh, the sources of the plastic, hopefully. And unfortunately, I don't have a video of me working in the lab, but <laughs> here is a photo. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justine. We will have a Q&A later in the roundtable. And I would like to invite now um, Fabio from uh, APA to share his screen. It will talk a little bit about involving the aquaculture producers in this process. Welcome, Fabio. Uh, hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me OK. Is it OK for you? Yeah, it's amazing. Can you share your screen, please? All right, perfect. Yeah, sure. So I think you can see it now. Yeah, perfect. All right. So let me take this out of the way. So yeah, uh, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, for having the opportunity to talk uh, in behalf of the aquaculture sector. Um, it's very important for us to participate in these types of, of projects, because of course, if we produce uh, animal protein, we want to be the first ones to know that our product has uh, a good quality. So it is important to keep in mind these types of, of contamination and, and to be aware that we have to reduce uh, the use of this plastic. So first of all, I'm going to give you a small background of uh, why agriculture uh, is important and it's going to be uh, way more important in the future. Of course, this is like the Bible of agriculture. Uh, fish stocks are, are really um, going down or are very stable uh, in the last years and are going uh, down now. So aquaculture is the only re uh, replacement for fish production and for fish consumption. So in Portugal, the main species that we, we produce uh, are these ones shown in the picture. So we have sea bream, sea bass, trout, turbot, and then we have uh, all different kinds of bivalves, which are oysters, uh, clams, and, and mussels. So aquaculture production in Portugal has been steadily, uh, steadily increasing over the time. Uh, most of the species uh, have a, a slight increase over the time, uh, even though there are some fluctuations over the years. And there are, of course, uh, aquaculture being a, a very big part of the economy and uh, a sector that uh, produces uh, animal protein highly depends on the use uh, of plastic. We've, we have already seen some uses uh, shown in a presentation, for example, from HIPMA, that uh, where agriculture uses those, those plastics. But it is also important to note that uh, some companies, and especially the major companies in Portugal, have a sense of responsibility in this case. And even if there aren't the, the, the norms or the uh, re regulation or legislation uh, necessary, to apply in this case of uh, the plastic reduction, the major companies in Portugal actually voluntarily work towards uh, the lesser use of these plastic materials. So the main uses of these plastic materials in aquaculture are, of course, the, the plastic tubes in almost all of the aquaculture productions, except, of course, in uh, bivalves, in shellfish, because that's made uh, on the shore, on the water. 
I, I don't need to mention the why they are used. They're used universally because of uh, their properties. Then we have the styrofoam boxes for the fish transport, um, mainly used to conserve the quality of the fish or the freshness. Uh, it's also a really good thermo, thermo isolator. But uh, we will see some, I'm, I'm first presenting you the cases where we use the plastic, but there are a lot of cases that people start to use different materials. There are norms from the European Commission that actually uh, present some alternatives. Some of them are not ideal and might incur in, into a high increase in the, the price of the final product, but they're, they're a good start at least to, to, so that we can get rid of this plastic use. Then we have the fish food. Most of the fish food and the fish and the bags uh, are plastic made. So uh, it is important that some alternatives are, are, are found and some companies are, are already um, working towards it. Then we have a lot of uh, tarpaulins. So this, these are used to protect the, tank, the tanks from predation, from, the, from different conditions, from light and so on. And these are, are also very durable. So even if they are used, they, they don't need to be regularly or regularly uh, replaced because they're very durable. So if you buy one, you, you probably will, will have it and will, will serve for, for the entire uh, of, of the production life. Then we have uh, the, the, the gloves, the latex gloves. Uh, these gloves are, are essential for, for any research and for working with, with fish that are very susceptible to diseases and, and avoids the cross-contamination, of course. Uh, there are also a lot of, uh, or in the past recent times, there are a lot of European leg legislation for, for these kinds of plastic uses. Uh, they're not mandatory, but it's a, a good uh, step into working towards a, a lesser uh, plastic environment. And there are a lot of guidelines in a reduction of plastic use. And of course, we as an association also uh, make sure, and we are part of the European Federation of Aquaculture, and we have our word uh, in, in building these this types of, of guidelines so that the producers can use. Well, of course, uh, what is the, the way forward then to reduce this, this plastic use? Uh, in aquaculture, of course, the three R's are, are applied. We mostly focus on, on reusability and reducing the quantities or the amounts of plastic that, that we use. And of course, this is a, a more general uh, uh, idea and a more general thing that, that every company is doing. And of course, agriculture also does, which is getting rid of all the single, single use plastics. And then um, when we can, of course, we try to use reusable, reusable gloves. Latex, latex gloves are also are still essential for some of the processes that are already explained. But there are some cases where we can use reusable gloves and this is a good alternative to reduce the amount of, of plastic. Or, and then we have the tarpaulins. Uh, here we have a special case of a product. Uh, the tarpaulins are, are very durable, so they usually don't need replacement, but when they do, because they're so so durable and, and they're, uh, they're hard to, to deteriorate, we actually uh, donate them to, to our purposes. And uh, in these cases, the major companies, major Portuguese companies actually require you to send a photo of what you will uh, use the sore pollens in so that they're, of course, um, they know that you didn't uh, have a bad use for that, for that plastic and that you didn't just discard it uh, on the street or somewhere. Then we have the plastic bags from the oyster productions that we already, uh, people already talked in these presentations. And there are some alternatives to these plastic bags, but they're, they're pretty much essential for the oyster production. But what, what we can do and what we are doing uh, over time is uh, you can see in the picture that the plastic bags uh, also have a plastic tube that seals the bags. And that plastic tube, uh, it, it's now we have this uh, alternative method, which are metal bars that lock in the, 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 the bags in place which can be used there, of course, make the thresholds a little bit heavier. And, uh, and there's still some studies to be made uh, whether it is uh, a good alternative or not, but it is an alternative to the plastic use. And of course, 
uh, the main thing that that we as an association do as well uh, with our producers is we have the responsibility to 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 find these alternatives for our our associates and we also uh, have a lot of um, work with research institutes and in this case we we, we came together with the plastic c uh, project because uh, i think we think that it, it it is essential for us to know uh, the composition of our waters of our of our fishes uh, of our bivalves as well so we have a, a a big role in working with research institutes uh, so that the production can can be more efficient and uh, what are the main uh, areas in which the research sector can also have a, a big a big impact well, uh, we've seen already uh, in the last in the last presentation that that we can um, analyze the water, analyze the sediment, and it is also important, for example, in fish uh, cultures to analyze the food that we give to our fishes. So uh, the fishes usually mirror the the food contents. So it is important, or it would be important to analyze the the plastic composition of, uh, or if if these food products have any plastic in their composition. Then uh, we have uh, one case that was already shown here as well, uh, which are the, the ground tanks uh, where we have from, these are mainly tanks that uh, were salt productions and now are aquaculture and produce fish, mainly sea, sea bream and sea bass. And uh, here it is important to evaluate the contents of, of microplastics in this water because the water uh, comes, comes in naturally. So it is usually water that is around the, the, the tank and it is either pumped or it comes in with the high tides. And then it is important to evaluate this water and see uh, the plastic content of the water. Then finally, uh, our work as an association uh, to avoid this plastic contamination. It's also visible in the terrain. We, of course, uh, I think that we have the best office in the world uh, to, to work on. Uh, we are on the field every day. And uh, if, if my neighbor um, doesn't uh, take care of his, of his production as well as I do, I will be affected by my neighbor. So it is important to keep in mind that uh, if we pollute our environment, we are, we are polluting the environment for all producers around. So we have a visible case that occurred um, earlier this year in which uh, a producer used plastic clamps and most of the producers use these plastic uh, clamps. They're, they are legal to use. Uh, but uh, when you don't need them, you should all, always discard them and, and into a proper place, of course. And what this producer was, was doing was that he was just discarding the, the, the plastic clamps into the water. And uh, this is not only bad and, and really bad for his production, but these plastic clamps would also come uh, to, to water productions because it comes with, it, with a tide. And so... We could see these uh, all around in the Algarve region, uh, polluting uh, our environment. And then we also see, uh, have seen some hooks from, from the plastic bags, uh, from the oysters. And, and then if we don't uh, act in this in these cases, then, then uh, all the producers will be affected by this. So uh, it is uh, our work as an association to, to report the problem. And actually the government, the government had a really quick answer to this, to this problem. The, the producer was fined and he cleaned everything. And I think he learned his lesson. He's still producing. He's producing uh, in a good way. So it is not polluting anymore. And, and, and we as an association have, have that role uh, in the producers. So uh, this was uh, all from, from us, from, from APA. Uh, I think that uh, this project is really nice to, to show the, the, the contents of plastic in aquaculture. And if you need any questions, I will leave my, my contacts here if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Fabio. Uh, and I think we are a lot closer to the schedule. So I would like to thank everyone for being so concise with your presentations. And we will now go into the roundtable session. The intent of this roundtable is to uh, scout some expectations and some motivations that led these partners to join this program, as well as let you both at home and in here uh, at University of Algarve to pose your questions to the researchers. So I would like to welcome to the stage um, Sonia Cristina, Laura Ribeiro, Bruno Fragoso, Paulo Pedro, and Justine, please.
So I would like to address my first question to both Paulo and uh, Laura um, about what drove you to join this microplastic um, project. Is there a, a raising concern that microplastic might be affecting both salt and fish producers? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can take this. Yeah, of course. Um, yes, uh, the the reason was uh, that we were already working with microplastics because it was a need from our clients. Um, maybe I'm a, a little skeptic about the real impact of microplastics in salt because um, it's true that we find microplastics. We find microplastics everywhere. Uh, the amount of uh, uh, use of salt per day, yeah. uh, it's not so it's significant. significant, but um, uh, this is also uh, drive uh, by the market and uh, they are worried about that because people start talking about the amount of microplastics in salt. Before that, they talked about the amount of, of uh, heavy metals in salt. So it's always something that uh, people take a lot of attention because it's uh, salt is a kind of a concentrator of all the bad things that exist in the world. Um, so um, the producers were really worried because the market was worried about that. So uh, there were, uh, the concern existed before the project. Uh, of course, they are also interested in the results and in uh, understanding how they can improve, how they can, uh, in the process, get rid of the of the all the contaminations of plastic, um, and show a, a cleaner image of uh, the product that they mm -hmm. put into the market. Of course, very important. So my uh, <laughs> participation was because there was a need before from my clients, and uh, when the uh, the the project came out, it was for us it was very important to participate. Of course, Laura. In our case with IPMA, it was a, a kind of a challenge by Paulo Pedro. Uh, he was concerned about salt, but it was also important to involve bivalve production. And as I explained a little bit at our fish uh, aquaculture, aquaculture research station, we mainly do research with fish. But since we had uh, oysters using in a more sustainable production, which is trying to recycle and maintain the water quality, we accept a challenge because of course, Microplastics in general are a concern, and of course, the microplastics are even a bigger concern because they become a little bit inv invisible. And since we are working with uh, uh, fresh food uh, consumers, it's important that we can also assess our trying to monitor how much the how, how is the quantity in the water, how much reaches the, the, the organisms, are they a danger to consumers? So all of those questions that will be addressed by other research groups, of course, are important to, to know. And therefore, it was important for us to part to collaborate with this project and trying to at least at our facilities try to identify some of the the, the way in and how the microplastics will go. In this case, for the oysters, it will be important also to go for the fish, but the budget was not so high. <laughs> and Justine had a lot of samples to do already. So we will keep with the oysters, but of course, we'll be also concerned with fish. And it will be important also uh, to assess uh, uh, is it will, will these uh, uh, microplastics work as disruptors in terms of physiological pathways for humans and for organisms? Or are they get, getting rid of? Because there are also studies that show that uh, some microplastics were not affected, were not incorporated. So it's still a wide area and a, I think an important area of research in the future. Of course, there's a lot of lack of information. Yeah, 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 yeah. That and needs think, to be filled. And it will be important just to finish. It will be important also to know, uh, in a way, if we can uh, reduce or utilize other equipments in order to minimize the quantity, if it does really affect consumer. So it, I think it's really be important to, 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 to do that uh, study. Thank you very much. Okay. I would like to invite either the ones present here or the ones on Zoom to pose their questions to Laura and to Paulo. We will, wait, we will wait a little bit. Are there questions in the room? 
No? Don't be shy. <laughs> um, are there questions on Zoom? I would ask them to put raise their hand up on the chat if there are some questions. No? Okay. So I'd like to address another question to, and particularly to Justine about what are the expectations for the other samples of the second campaign? Are you expecting similar results to what you've seen already or uh, any type of seasonality? What are your expectations? Uh, I would expect quite similar in the way of what I found already. Um, I'd be interested to see if there is a difference between the seasonality. Um, I mean, either way, it's just good to have more data, uh, but I'm not so sure. I mean, I haven't actually uh, analyzed all of the organisms from uh, what I've got even from the first campaign. So I'm interested to see mostly the difference between aquaculture and the coastal samples, because I mean, that's the whole reason for this is to see if what we're doing in aquaculture is really affecting what we're eating. Uh, if the wild ones have more, if the aquacultural ones have more because of the plastic that we use, it's difficult to tell. Um, but hopefully it will give us some results on that. Of course, and as you said, Olion might be a... Yeah, the location that we sampled in Olion, um, nobody would want to eat from this location, I assure you. It's... Uh, very bad. But the thing is, the ocean is all connected. So if you're going to eat mussels that were grown in this area or down the coast a little bit, there could be pollution in any of these places. Yeah, but the, the results that you have in Ipo, for example, are completely different yeah. in the water than what you have in Olhão. Yes, so think, probably yeah, in Olhão, you are kind of uh, sampling places. wastewater. Yeah, I mean, the, the location in Olhão, I mean, it's close to where the aquacultural site is, but it is a harbor and it is an accumulation zone for. Yeah. But although near, it is far away <laughs> in terms of the water quality. And I think it's important also to address what is aquaculture, because normally for me, aquaculture is closed, is inland. And uh, we are talking about the aquaculture of bivalves outside that are exposed, although so it can, it, it's a little bit different. Um, yeah, I think it's important then when reporting and discussing what are the type of aquaculture that we are referring, because uh, the, 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 the bivalves aquaculture is very extensive, is in the, in, in open space. Of course, in, in the, uh, in our facility at the aquaculture research station in Olhão, we have an entrance, although exposed, there's a, a bigger control of the water that uh, incomes. We control the water in the inlet, but then we have a, a sand filter that will take uh, some of the macroplastics at least. So it might be a little bit different, might uh, clean a little bit water. That's the yeah, purpose of sure. that filter. <laughs> for sure. But it's important to differentiate uh, the aquaculture because um, normally we use, of course, everything is aquaculture for you. But for me, I always divide in fish farm and shellfish because these different particularities <laughs> and uh, it will be important. In, and I'm curious to, to see, <laughs> to see just, that. Just an adding. Yeah. She, that the sampling station that Justine it's it's sample in just one place in the lagoon system. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to have a, a, a overall picture of the lagoon, we have to measure yes, the so microplastics in several places because course. the hydrodynamics in that place is it's completely huge. different in other places. Yeah, so yeah. we cannot assume that it's really bad because we need to 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 have it's more a reference it's a reference uh, yeah more um sites of sampling mm -hmm. inside of the loop yes, yes of course. this is completely a very dynamic uh, system yes that true. the hydrodynamics change from one point to the another one the one the the the, the first what the first day that we went to sampling, it was to define which, what are going to be our study sites. So we started with ones that are, um, we identified places where we have also seen some impact from plastics in the area. Okay. So that's why we are going to that point. If we have funding for future development of, of uh, another project, we will probably increase the area of of sites. 
Yeah, of course. Yeah. I was going to ask just okay. that to Sonia and, and Bruno. What was the thought process behind choosing those sites? And if there were some um, in the sampling process, uh, was that something that could indicate higher concentrations or lower concentrations, either um, offshore or near shore? There were previous uh, projects that have some indication of, of already concentrations of microplastics that also give, give us a, like a guidance to choose some of the stations. But other ones, we, we went to the, the, to the local area and then we define which will be, because we have to have a place that we have mussels, access to the sediments and water. Mm -hmm. And this was the key thing to define the yeah. study site. Uh, so there are places that we have very good access to sediment, but we don't have mussels in that particular area. So we want mussels to be comparable along the coast. Yeah. So this is, was defined our strategy for the sampling yeah. sites. As well, we wanted to have uh, several points uh, to contribute for the modeling part of the, of the project. On the West Coast, and then on, uh, on the South along the the other coast and we'll probably show harbors as uh, point sources of microplastics and maybe other areas that are not near harbors they have less plastic mm -hmm. but these different points probably will connect it with uh, hydrodynamics of the coast will uh, give us mm -hmm. an idea where this uh, accumulation points might be or uh, but then only modeling will, will I'll tell yeah. yeah we are now even interesting thing to see in the results of Justine, like in Tavira, that it's showing that we are we don't have plastics in the water, but we sample in the in one place. For me, that now I'm I'm curious if if I have samplings not in that specific side, but in the other side of the mouth of the river, because yeah. we saw the flow of the river, and probably they have problems more with plastics. We, ne we don't know, but it was curiosity to see also another okay. uh, Sorry, place. Dynamic also. Yeah, because it's completely, uh, the hydrodynamic is completely changed. But for all, uh, us, as a strat strategy of sampling, we have all the three things that we sample, the muscles and the water in that specific place. The other side, we just can't cat catch just water and uh, and uh, the sediments, not the organisms. So it um... it will be very <laughs> surprising to know what yeah, can yeah, come yeah. out of this yeah. of this project. But, very interesting. But for now, I think even the result it's quite quite interesting to see. Yeah, and as mm -hmm. said, arbors seem to be a focal point for these microplastics and, and if you know can be a, a way to find mitigation measures within the harbors to reduce this yeah. can, uh, can be because of the boats and the, with and the fishermen and the handling and the teaching the fishermen the, get new nets yeah new ropes yeah they, yeah 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 when they are dealing there uh, yeah, yes yes but, yes yes of course so it's the Maybe. And working with the with the structures that and, they have and yeah, handling, yeah. It's seen that it's a lot of microfibers from the ropes, probably. Okay. Yes, Something yes, yes. Like and because they are exposed to sea water, sun, yeah. <laughs> strength. New, when they get new ropes, uh, every time a new cable is prepared, they are losing fibers straight away. Okay. And they are dealing that in the harbor. Of course. They into the boat. Uh, of course. And they will. So a lot of particles are. Yeah. yeah. Of course, and, and as Bruno said, if you can identify the focal point, you can work on the mitigation yes, process. Incredible. I think Fabio had a question. Fabio? I believe you. Yes, you had I, your had a, I didn't have a question, but I wanted to, to complete a thought that was presented there. But uh, I don't think I had uh, I have anything else to add because I, I wanted to, to say as well what uh, was said already because it is important to uh, differentiate uh, types of aquaculture. So if you go to shellfish aquaculture or mussels, uh, bivalves, I mean, that's aquaculture inshore uh, or in the water. So you're already directly in the water. But if you go to an intensive uh, cultivation, then you might have very different results. Uh, it also pumps water from the sea, 
but as it, as as it was said there as well, we have a lot of mechanical filters, biological filters. There's a, a big process that cleans the water, and it, it is important to not refer to in in the project or 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 else reporting. Uh, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. as as aquaculture is it is it a, a type of aquaculture that uh, presents those results? Yeah. Okay. That is very important. Yeah, because we are trying to. It's not a question of uh, um, cleaning up the 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 the, the way the, the aquaculture is seen, but uh, there's also a, a lot of negative <laughs> aspects always with the, with aquaculture that must be because they, sometimes they are not true. The people are not sometimes wondering these aspects regarding the meat production, but with the fish, they are more careful <laughs> when referring to production. And sometimes the people are, are misinformed. So we have to be careful when saying some things <laughs> that we know that are destroying all of the work that is being done <laughs> in terms of uh, the more general acceptance of aquaculture. So if a product that they are safe <laughs> and then good quality of nutrition in the point of view. <laughs> And can be easily controlled. Yes, uh, much more easily controlled. Of course, are true. more difficult to control. Yes, yes, yes. In terms of, 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 for sure, in terms of pollution, for sure, that in uh, inland agriculture can be more controlled. Of course. Uh, is there some questions in the room, Professor? Oh, I think uh, John is the... also. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm, I speak very loudly. <laughs> 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 I'm hoping, uh, this is John Icey, oh, okay. I just wanted to ask Justine a quick question. You haven't got any results for the offshore aquaculture yet, or have you? The offshore in Cyclis, no. No, because that will be really interesting. To yes. Relative to the harbour, mm -hmm. which is very bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's curious. Yes, I'm curious. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I would like first to um, say that I'm very glad to see Sara Vital uh, hearing us because Sara Vital was the uh, the first one who did uh, microplastics in mussels in the Algarve and where is the first paper is published. And the first question is, are there data difference? Uh, they don't seem to be very different from uh, the first ones that she produced uh, when she was finishing up the degree. Um, but I, I, I'm quite sure there's going to be differences in the aquaculture. And I'd like to point out that we selected bivalves because we eat them whole. And in the uh, other agriculture, we, we only look for different organs that we normally don't eat if you're talking about fish. Yeah, yeah, so sure. um, the important thing here, I guess, is probably the difference of the shellfish. Uh, previous results we got, we had a lot of clams with uh, black plastics, okay. which we link to these traps that you use for uh, octopus and things like that, mm -hmm. a lot more than in bivalves. So it's going to be very important to see the difference between the different species. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you very yeah. much, Professor. I would like to ask one more question to both Bruno and Sonia about what, what, what were the main um, difficulties when doing the sampling process? Because we've had a two years now of pandemic so certainly there were some constraints and particularly for offshore sampling there must be some um, constraints due to the hydrodynamics so i would like to know a little bit about that yes for the sampling offshore we always um, have to look at the weather forecast see if it's really stormy or not and uh, but beside of that uh, we, we if it's not a big swell or not a strong current, we we can do it. Normally, we choose to do it during nip tides instead of spring tides. So, in 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 my case, was to find mussels in some <laughs> <laughs> in some uh, study sites. It was not easy to find it. Uh, some they have reasonable a lot of them that we can collect several organisms, but in some we have to climb and, and it was not so easy as that. 
In respect to COVID times, it was uh, in the beginning, it was a little bit challenge because we cannot go to the, 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 to the sea or to the coast. And, uh, but I think even with the aquaculture, the contacts we, we made with aquacultures, it was, uh, they are really comprehensive with that. Some of them, they, 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 we just went and meet them and they just bring with the organism. We cannot go to the aquaculture to work with them due to the restrictions. And some of them, they came to the university and bring the, the organism. So one of the aquaculture, we have to thank you, thank him very much because he came from Aveiro to bring us this, the organisms. Wow. Okay. Uh, so this is, is has been a very nice um, teamwork with the partners and also to connect with the aquacultures and also with with uh, some volunteers that also can uh, went with us to help us. Also Sienna that helped us in the last uh, last um, sampling <laughs> <laughs> because we have a very big uh, macro algae uh, in the beach. So this one of the, the one of your group he, he swim until he catch the water. <laughs> so it was. Uh, but it was besides the COVID. I think it, we 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 managed well to do all the the sampling with all the security measurements and and so on. Of course, it is a big group effort, and I think everyone is very pleased with the with the outcome. Um, I was going to ask. Oh, Sara has a question. Brilliant, Sara. Can you unmute your um, mic, please? Hi, hello, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you just perfect. Okay. I just want to congratulate everyone on this project because it is a really important project. And especially thank uh, Professor Muye Zhuang Bian uh, because this is really important uh, project. Thank <laughs> you very just, much. Yeah. <laughs> and congratulations because as Professor said, Sara has published a paper on this topic as well. Uh, are there any more questions in the room or in Zoom? Or any comments? Fabio, would you like to say something? Okay. I'll no, stop. did I have my hand up? No, 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 no. <laughs> Just <laughs> see if you well, wanted I, to touch on, on that it, topic. I think I, I told everything in my presentation. It is a really important project for, for agriculture as well. Because, and the main reason is because, because we are the ones that produce uh, fish, that produce shellfish. We are the ones that want our, our, our products to be first quality. So yeah. we want to know the composition of microplastics, what we can do to improve it. And these this products are really important to know that. Thank you very much, Fabio. And with that, I think we wrap up this session. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we will now go to the presentation by Eloa about uh, modeling. So Eloa, can you join me on stage, please? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Elo. I'm part of the group that is at the WorkPad 4 to try to understand the transport of macroplastic in the ocean. And part of the group is with the Professor Flavio Martins and João Janeiro. So the goal of this project, this work pad is to identify the main pathways of the macroplastic from sourced from the Algarve coast, as well as detected possible hotspots uh, in this region and quantify the macroplastic fluxes uh, between adjacent areas from the study area. Just to give a brief review about the transport, because it's a little bit different. After the microplastic enters in the ocean, they can be transported by the currents, the wind, as well as the characteristics of the, the microplastics can change this transport. So if the microplastic would be denser because of the size, the shape or density or the type of the polymer, they will sink to the seafloor or if it, the microplastic is lighter, they will be transported for a long period on the upper layer of the ocean. However, these characteristics can change with the time spent at the ocean. So it can become quite weaker and fragment more. So the heavier uh, particles can go that it stays in the ocean floor 
can go up in upper layers while the, the particles that was a little bit lighter and floating on the surface when attached by the microplast, the, the microorganisms can start getting heavier and sink. So that parameters uh, become, makes the understand of the transport of microplastic very complex and very difficult to study. We have two ways to understand the transport. One is collecting in situ data or the water and sampling filter, while the other one is trying to apply numeric modeling uh, to understand transport and the possible accumulation areas. Many scientists start applying numeric models to understand this transport in global and regional uh, scale. And here is one of these projects where he not only simulate for macroplastic, but for the different uh, sizes of plastics and counted the density, the accumulation by number of pieces or by the density the, of the plastic. And we can see when you count by the number, macroplastics are the dominant, while when we count it by the mass of the plastic, the macroplastics become dominant, uh, on, especially on the oceanic gyrus. So for us to understand a little bit of the transport of the macroplastic in this region, we need to have a better idea of the circulation of this area. And this Portugal area uh, is dominated by three major larger uh, circulate currents. One is the Portuguese current, the other one is the Azor currents and the Canary currents. The Portuguese current is a uh, wide and the slow southward current that flows through the entire Western Iberia coast. And when reach the Cape St. Vincent, they can split in two frames, one turning and getting into the Gulf of Cats, which becomes the Gulf of Cats current, and the other one continue floating south and join the Canary Current. While the Azores current comes flowing eastward, uh, entering the Gulf of Cats and towards the Mediterranean as well. In the other branch, they flow southward and combine, you know, kind of flowing parallel with the Canary Current <coughs> on North Africa. Just when we go towards the coast, then the dynamic, the circulation becomes way more complex and, and characterizes with uh, season patterns. So during the winter, we can see the predominance of the poleward current along the coast, while during the summer, because of the presence of the north wing, uh, we have start having the upwelling, which is a southward current that contorns the Cape St. Vincent and continues eastward to, to the coast. So for us to uh, achieve our goals, we start using numeric modeling. And for the, start, for the modeling, we need an oceanic model domain. And this, for this project, we selected the Mercator uh, domain that is available by Kimens. <coughs> and it's a very easy to get this data. You just go to Kimens and select the area and you can do the download. This, uh, the Mercator is a good data because it can give a big range of uh, date or a big range of dates at the time and as well as it's a reanalysis. So they can use not only modeling but the acquired data from in situ like boils and satellites to improve this product. And to be able to track the particle we use the Lagrangian particle tracking. More specifically, we use the software Open Drift, which is written in Python language. So we can easily um, customize for our product, for our goal. And that's kind of our result that when we combine these two uh, ocean, these two modeling, the arrows are the circulation and the particles represents the microplastics uh, emitting on the coast. So for this project, we emitted, uh, we decided to do three simulations with different scenarios. And the differences between one scenario to another is the depth that we release the particles. So for this model, this model, we didn't apply the vertical transport of the particle, even though we know that it's very important for the transport to understand the distribution of particles. Uh, we still don't have so many good studies about the 
about uh, about the behavior of the particle for us to be actually confident enough to put it in the model. So we decided to simulate in three different depths where we have three different currents to see if these currents will have a huge impact on the transport. So for the first two scenarios, that is the first one we apply, we release particles at the surface. And the second scenario, we release, uh, we release the particles at 30 meters. With 30 meters, we decided to see just the impact of the circulation without the wind, without the atmosphere on the transport. So we release part 20, 46 particles every day along the Algarve coast. And for the 800 meters, because that's where we have the Mediterranean outflow waters domination, uh, we release particles along of the 800 meters bathymetry. The results are shown uh, the previous results. So this map is just the trajectory of the particles and the colors are the time that the particles are spent on the, on, the simul on the model, on the domain. And we, we didn't exhibit it, didn't show the entire all particles because we've become a mess. So we selected randomly 50 particles and we plotted and we can see that part, the particles released here at the coast quickly will travel or to the south or to the Mediterranean, into the Mediterranean. So in less than four, min, more, four months, all the particles will be transported to, to south or Mediterranean. And while some few, uh, few particles will be drifting here for a long time between the Canary Islands and the Madeira. When we see the results of the particles released at 30 meters depth, we can see already different kind of transport. We see that particles stay longer here on the coast. Sometimes they can even stay 12 months. And most of them are transported towards the, the, towards the Mediterranean. While the few ones that can, uh, that was able to go to the north, to the North Atlantic, more into the North Atlantic, we will stay for if, even up 36 months. And for the particles that was released at 800 meters, then it's a completely different transport and trajectory. They will stay here for a long time in front of the Portugal coast, while they will be spreading and staying longer and longer time uh, the way they were going offshore. So this is the map of the distribution of the trajectories. So we can see that a lot of particles will be transported towards the Canary Islands, as well as to the Mediterranean, you can see here high accumulation. And when it's 30 meters, the particles will just go flow, drifted directed to the Mediterranean along the coast. In 30 meters, in 800 meters, the particles will spread in front of the Portugal coast uh, with high concentrations along the coast. These numbers, this scale is in logarithmic to have a better view of the particles. And as we saw that the surface and at 30 meters, a lot of particles flow to the mid, into the Mediterranean, we trying to see for how long they will wash it to the Mediterranean. So 4,000 particles that we release it were washed in less than five months into the Mediterranean and over there they stay. And while 5,000 particles will be washed after 10 months. And at the surface, we can see less particles were transported to, at, sorry, at 30 meters, we can see that less particles were, was transported into the Mediterranean, but as well, it took longer time for them to reach the area. And they can go from zero months to 20 months to this Mediterranean. The next stage was, is to try to discover the sources if it, and have another stereo, stereo uh, sources reaching uh, or impacting our coast, as well as trying to identify the hotspots around this region. We have a small Q&A um, 
space for Taina. So please uh, raise your hand on the chat or in here. If you have any questions, feel, feel free to pose your questions. Are there any questions in the room about the modeling um, part of the project or in, on Zoom? So I think we'll move on to Taina's um, presentation on human health impacts of microplastics. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's fine. Well, my name is Taina Fonseca. I am a postdoctoral researcher in CIMA. I work with Angela Serafin, who is in charge of this work package related to the impacts of uh, microplastics in human health. But unfortunately, she tested positive for COVID and she couldn't come, but she's recovering well, and this is good. <laughs> um, well, I don't want to sound tedious for you because uh, most of you already know a lot about microplastics in the marine environment. And the scientific evidence says a lot, including the research that we have been doing in our lab also, uh, that the microplastics that are floating in the oceans, they are ingested by the organisms and then they are transferred to different tissues and organs. And they can also act as Trojan horses. Uh, it means that they are internalized in the organism and they are carrying different chemicals uh, together with them. And these chemicals and the particle itself are also going inside the cell and becoming very harmful in terms of uh, cytotoxic responses, DNA damage, problems in the defenses of the cells. And of course, it will um, generate uh, ecological implications that are very critical in a long-term uh, aspect because we have also problems in, in biotoxicity, level development, and problems in reproduction of the population. So the point is, um, with all this data gathered, we are always saying that we have to save the ocean, but we are seeing in ourselves humans as something really detached from all these uh, problems. So. Um, Actually, we don't need to be experts or scientists to know that the plastic pollution somehow is creating uh, harmful effects to our health indirectly or directly. None of us, I'm pretty sure, wouldn't like to go to the beach with a landscape of plastic pollution like this, or neither would allow our kids to play around with the, the plastic waste in the in the in these beaches and be exposed to these threats. So uh, something that is really interesting to bear in mind uh, nowadays is also uh, something that Professor Viviano talked uh, in the beginning of this uh, session, that the uh, face masks are also being a very critical problem because of the uh, mismanagement, the, um, the waste that it's being generated. And uh, around 130 billion uh, of face masks are being discarded monthly globally. So it's also a problem of public health uh, beyond the environmental uh, problem. And also we cannot forget that the plastic, uh, they are um, polymers and they are made of organic chemicals, synthetic chemicals, they are being leached, they are being washed in the marine environment. So uh, beyond the problem of the microplastics, we, are, we have also the additives that are used in the manufacture of these uh, materials. And also, in a very clear way, we see you uh, with even more with uh, more frequency nowadays that the fragments of microplastics are being found inside different species with ecological and economical relevance. Um, and they are with different shapes, different numbers, and different polymers. And of course, since these microplastics, they uh, are now part of the diet of the aquatic organisms in a fair way, they end up again in us. And as many of the partners already talked, uh, like the importance of the shellfish species, especially here in the Algarve, namely the clams and the mussels, the oysters. So everything is uh, ending up in these animals that are used as uh, human, uh, as food resources. And 
here in the example of the mussels as well. And what happens uh, when we eat these animals that are uh, contaminated by microplastics? They enter in the gastrointestinal tract in what way? I'm just uh, really briefly here explaining that this is a cut of the, the lumen of the intestine and the pink cells um, are the epithelium and they, tiny yellow, yellow cell represents like a security guard of this tissue. And the M cells, which is this yellow one, will uh, check if there are virus, uh, foreign bodies in this, uh, in this organ, and will take the microplastics as one of these foreign bodies that, and will transport them inside the epithelium and then be managed to lymphatic system and then to the bloodstream. And also they can enter the, the tissue by some loose uh, junctions between the cells, also being carried to the um, systemic circulation. So one of the evidence that uh, came up uh, in 2019, uh, showing that the microplastics are being eaten by us uh, is the pool. So they studied the feces. So they found that around 20 particles of microplastics were found per 10 grams of feces with nine different types of polymers being detected. Among them, the polypropylene and the polyethylene, which are found in food and juice containers, water bottles, cooking oil, toys, uh, furniture and clothes. So it's uh, very scary. And for those, who are in the room and say, I'm completely away of this because I don't eat any animals, I don't eat anything that comes from the ocean, but I uh, have bad news. We are always also breathing the microplastics as well. So once they are inside, we, are, we breathe them, what happens? We have the upper airways uh, composed uh, that consists of the nasal cavity, the nose, the mouth, and the larynx. In this upper part of the uh, tract, we have a uh, thicker layer and um, the cells uh, that have uh, cilium and they avoid the microplastics to enter and go through the, the bloodstream. But of course, like the tiny ones, less than one micrometer can uh, uh, be transferred. And once they reach the lower airways uh, in the bronchi, uh, they can go inside also uh, reaching the bloodstream. So once these, um, these microplastics or nanoplastics, of course, they are being, um, they are entering in the bloodstream, they are translocated to every other organ. So uh, the way that they are circulating in our body will depend on hydrophobicity of the surface of the microplastic, the surface charge, the protein that is coating this polymer, and the particle size, of course. But in a general way, they will all uh, trigger inflammation responses in our body because inflammation is when, basically when we have um, a foreign body that is uh, being, um, that our body identifies and to, to fight against. So in a very um, disturbing way, it was published in the beginning of this year, a paper uh, showing that now the microplastics uh, are really uh, reaching the human placenta. And as we know, the placenta represents an organ that um, makes the interface between the maternal and the baby environment and it's very critical for the nurturing and also with the contact with this external uh, environment and it's it's still unknown what are the the, the consequences that it may um, happen with this accumulation in the placenta in this work uh, particularly um, nine women were voluntary and the placenta were collected and in a very disturbing way four placentas showed that the microplastic fragments and around 12 um, in the size range of five to ten micrometers the three um, 
uh, in the upper part, the three images show the polypropylene fragments. These nine placentas down here in, um, showing the residues of pigments. And what is really scary is that some of these pigments are used in makeups, for instance. So uh, we have uh, here very clearly uh, the consequence of the, the lifestyle and the, the daily um, habits that we have. Uh, so these uh, results, they from a paper that was published this year, it's not from our group, they just reinforce the uh, work package five from the Plastic C project that has as objectives to determine the levels of the microplastic additives they are um, using the manufacture of these polymers, uh, determinant then in maternal blood, placenta and umbilical cord blood for, um, of newborns in the coastal area of the Algarve, and also to detect the fragments of the microplastics. So so this work um, uh, is being done, but, um, but no, we have 41 samples collected, um, the placenta, the blood of the mothers, and also the, the fetal cord. And as you can see, all the region of the Algarve is being covered. The placentas, they were collected. Of course, the women all uh, signed the consent form and they were interviewed also in, in order that all the, the data that will be assessed in terms of the microplastics can be crossed and correlated with the demographic aspects, with the reproductive story of them, uh, also with the lifestyle um, habits. And this um, material, this biological material is already stored in minus 80. Uh, but the chemical analysis and the identification of the polymers will be done in the next year, and um, it, um, it will be very promising. It's a very promising result that will shock us somehow because any result, any identification that we may do in these uh, samples is, is a very clear impact of our exposure. And just to conclude my presentation um, in this Friday afternoon, I would like to say that today my baby is becoming one year and three months. And just to remember that like 30 years from now when he uh, becomes my age, it will be 2050 and we will have the scenario of more plastics than, than fishes in the ocean. And just to think about what is the future that we really want to the next generation and that the health may be uh, um, very affected by all this long-term exposure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dina. And lastly, to wrap up, we have Priscilla um, talking a little about uh, the next steps of the project and wrapping up what was said today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Priscilla Guella. I've been uh, involved in Plastic Sea mostly in sampling campaigns. I'm also interested because of my analytical uh, background. I'm mostly interested in the methods for uh, microplastic analysis, but I'm just here to wrap the, the meeting today and to summarize a little bit what has been done, what we achieved what was supposed to achieve and what are the next steps of the Plastic Sea project. So what we knew before, Tana just <laughs> mentioned and Professor Bien as well. So uh, there has been the global production of plastic has suffered a major increase and uh, in the last decades and a significant percentage of this uh, plastic ends up in the sea. Um, in the sea, in the ocean, it's present everywhere. Uh, of course, because of its, um, it's not only harmful because of the polymer itself, but because of also of its additives such as dyes, which enter the ecosystem. Um, but they are also absorbing uh, compounds such as pesticides and polyaromatic hydrocarbons metals which they then transport and concentrate as well and 
It obviously has a negative impact on um, marine organisms, not only physical, which we only, which we know very well. The pictures are everywhere, and we, we are really impacted by the visual problems that this is causing to marine animals. Uh, but this has, as Taina just mentioned, a heavy biochemical impact on marine organisms, and because we need to live also from the sea and there is a very large industry growing, we need to also think that this might have a negative impact in blue economy sectors, such as aquaculture or tourism or others. What do we want to achieve with Plastic Sea? Um, this are, was our main roadmap in this project. First, we wanted to assess the microplastic hotspots in Portuguese coast, which were not known uh, so far. We also want to know the chemical composition of microplastics, which are in the area. Then we want to also um, positively contribute because this is a new area of knowledge and there is much to do for standardize the, mod, uh, the methods for microplastic assessment, both on the samplings, um, sampling strategy as in the analytical process as well. There is a lot to do and we want to contribute with our, um, with our experience from this project. Then we also want to quantify and to assess microplastics in the saltwater products and aquaculture is very important. Uh, then we have the modeling that um, uh, <laughs> Eloa just present us the effort to know the the where is going the where is the microplastics going in the ocean, where is it more likely to accumulate or to stay, which is very important. And then finally, we want to also want to link with the human side of it okay so it's a very holistic approach it's a very complete complete approach and this is a very um uh, very um um big one, big one. <laughs> no project. ambitious project yes, yes. <laughs> i'm not ambitious that's why i don't remember <laughs> Just, no, no, just, <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> uh, where do we stand in our project activities? So, so far, uh, we, I tried to wrap up what we've been discussing, but so far we, we have uh, accomplished mostly all the sampling um, so far, okay? We have sampled coastal sites, 11 coastal sites all along Portugal. We have covered uh, two production seasons for salt production, 2020 and 2021. So it's already collected and analyzed microscopically. We also have, oh, sorry, I have the, <laughs> that's why it was so hard to breathe, sorry. <laughs> uh, we have also um, sampled uh, aquaculture facilities uh, covering intertidal and offshore um, sites. Uh, we have sampled different organisms, different types of organisms in different places and different kinds of aquaculture sites as well. Um, regarding the modeling, uh, there is already an idea of the fluxes and pathways, but now I think with the results coming from all these data sampling, uh, it will increase and it will uh, now it's possible to move forward in modeling. And then we also have samples for a, a significant amount of sampling done, uh, which is, by the way, which should not be easy to, to do, <laughs> um, to sample placenta and umbil umbilical cord and uh, from the region of Algarve. So we have sampled water, sediments, organisms, salt, and humans. It's a, it's a, a it's wide a range of sampling, so it's very interesting. Which are the next steps? I just have here a few 
um, because all along the talks you have been heard what is the next step in each of the working package, but just a quick overview of what we aim to do next. So we want to confer, uh, to do the confirmation and identification of plastic, sorry, uh, <laughs> double words, of plastic particles with other techniques, with the uh, micro tear. Um, this will tell us about the type and the chemical composition of the plastics we are finding in microscopy. Um, then we want to know <laughs> which is the transfer from mums to newborns, uh, which will, Taina just said it will be next year. Now we want to use the results obtained in the lab to improve the modeling, uh, the simulations we have. And finally, we want to establish the relationship between the results with the sources of microplastics. This is a, has been an exciting project. This has been a, a different project. Uh, so we hopefully, with these results in by the end, we hopefully will contribute um, to the overall uh, United Nations agenda. Um, plastic pollution has been directly linked with a um, sustained develop, sustainment development goal of 14, but it directly, as this, this publication says, the very recent one, that indirectly it can influentiate or is linked with 12 of the overall United, uh, United Nations sustained development goals. With this project, at least we can contribute uh, for the, those three uh, to try to minimize the challenge that microplastics is posing to the achievement of these goals. So, and I think it's all I have for today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Priscilla. I won't take up a lot more time. We wrapped up this event uh, a lot sooner than <laughs> we thought it would, but I would like to not just congratulate, but um, thank everyone at the Plastic Sea Project team because it has been a monumental effort and we hope to find a lot more in the near future and to know more about microplastics in our um, coastal areas and salt production, aquacultures, and human health. So thank you very much and have a lovely afternoon and a good weekend. Thank you very much.